Good afternoon and welcome to the first program for Economic Research live webinar series. I'm Sophia Johnson with the Program for Economic Research, one of the world's leading programs for identifying opportunities and strategies for enhancing economic research. Thank you for being with us today. Now this event will be live streamed via the Economics Department's YouTube channel. Uh, the conversation will also be recorded and closed captions will be provided in the days following. By attending, all participants agree to abide by the event's code of conduct, which is posted on our website, econ.columbia.edu forward slash per. As always, the Program for Economic Research in the Department of Economics at Columbia University takes no institutional position on matters of policy. Now, a little housekeeping before we begin. Each presenter will speak for 10 to 12 minutes Presenters have agreed to take your live questions at the end of both presentations. You can ask your question or you can also type your question in the chat. We invite you to follow us on Facebook, on Twitter or LinkedIn. And for this event, we are using the hashtag per live series. Finally, but certainly not least, Lauren Close, the program manager here at PER, is joining us. She handles logistics and communications for PER events like this one. She will be adding updates on social media and also posting comments on the chat page during our conversation today. So please be aware of that. So to begin, there's been a slight modification in our agenda. Mika Rokonen will be joining us in November instead of today. Today, our first speaker is Neil Ghosh, Senior Manager of Economics at Amazon. Uh, since 2015, he's taken on roles in hardware and devices, real estate, and now corporate development. Prior to Amazon, he was the lead economist for an online marketing startup in Austin, Texas that provides patient recruiting and engagement services for clinical trials. He began his career in economic forecasting and policy analysis for macroeconomic advisors, a consulting firm in St. Louis. Neil completed a PhD in economics from the University of Texas at Austin, an MS in finance and a bachelor's in economics from Washington University also in St. Louis. Neil, thank you so much for being with us. Now to begin, Amazon is really far from alone in its aggressive hiring of PhD economists. Companies ranging from Google, Facebook and Microsoft to Airbnb and Uber now all have large teams of PhD economists and dozens of other tech companies um, have hired smaller groups of economists. Can we begin by talking about the skills that PhD economists apply in tech companies, the companies that hire them, the types of problems that economists are currently working on and the areas of academic research that have emerged in relation to these problems? Uh, certainly. Uh, thank you, Sophia, for uh, allowing me to speak. And um, I should start by saying everything that I say here will be my uh, opinion and uh, my own experiences. They do not in any way uh, represent any official uh, positions on behalf of Amazon.com, which is my current employer. Uh, so I just like to make that disclaimer right up front uh, and just use this as a forum to sort of share my own sort of first person experiences and perspective. In it, uh, when I um, joined Amazon in 2015, uh, I, I don't think I could have ever um, predicted or projected just how much the, um, the, the role of an economist in a tech company would uh, technically different sort of industrial applications. Uh, I think it was an emerging idea at the time. Uh, and um, since then, I just think it's blossomed in many uh, wonderful ways that have opened, not only opened up job opportunities for PhD economists, but also I think shaped the way that technical tech corporations and organizations think about I would put them in the following buckets. Uh, I think the first one is that economists are, are trained in their PhD programs with these wonderful investigative tools. Uh, these tools um, range from, you know, empirical work.
So human activity um, that you know, our, our tool set is becoming more and more valuable, more and more in need. Um, the second reason I think is that we have these um, frameworks of understanding consumer behavior and you know, you know, uh, individual utility and how um, individuals make trade-offs and, and, and consider different choices against the budget constraints that they have or any other sort of um, constraints that they might be facing. And this, this framework and ability to sort of put all the pieces together in a way that can um, influence and help these business leaders and executives understand what it is that their customers are thinking through in relation to products and services they might engage with is really powerful. Um, there's lots of business schools out there, um, you know, MBA programs and other executive leadership, but they don't always get to that sort of principled framework of understanding why customers make choices and how that reflects in the products and the business uh, business decisions that are being developed, you know, on the on the organizational side. And so I think for those two reasons, that's really where the demand is coming from. And that's where ec economists have been successful in filling that void. Um, now, what do economists actually do? Well, I think, uh, again, it kind of boils into buckets. The first one is a is a very um, kind of empirical research focus uh, sort of role to be to be played. Uh, I think a very common application is that an economist might be faced with a question about, well, we implemented a certain product innovation or a campaign to reach different customers. Did it work or not? And this ends up looking like a very classic program evaluation, treatment effects, sort of um, causal identification type of problem. And there's a number of, there, you know, numerous applications and uh, at Amazon, and then of course, I'm sure in many other organizations where those types of studies are becoming um, very, very widespread. And it's not only studies in the sense that people are churning out uh, sort of paper after paper about, you know, this event or that event, there's becoming a whole method, sort of a sub-discipline of methodologies about how do you answer these questions in a more sort of uh, I hate to say the word scalable, but it's kind of overloaded, yeah. overloaded term, but how do you answer these questions in a very generalized sort of almost semi-automated way where you're constantly running these analyses almost in an automated software environment as opposed to um, a researcher sort of downloading some data and studying it themselves and then returning with an answer. Um, so that's a very, I think a very ubiquitous application. Um, similarly, I think um, time series has become a really popular uh, vein of econometrics inside um, technical organizations. And again, I think the reason is somewhat simple in its construction. It's just like a big part of operational planning whenever you're at a scale of a large company is just being able to forecast the short to medium term horizon and having that be and having that be accurate, you know, and 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 stable in some way that helps people plan and prepare what it is that they have to do. It, it kind of seems like a like a relatively ordinary thing, you know. And at least that was my impression. It's like, oh, like that's that's not like some sort of far fetched um, sort of research agenda. That's just that's just like kind of daily planning. But it's it's dramatic. It's it's dramatic how powerful that uh, building in some of these time series. Um, uh, econometric approaches into those planning processes, just how powerful an effect that can have on improving the accuracy of these forecasts and projections and helping these, um, these uh, business sort of uh, operators and leaders actually get some clarity and understanding about the future that awaits them and be able to, to control some of that. And I think that's a very powerful tool to give someone if you can say, well, within a certain um, sort of confidence band or in interval, I can help I can help kind of see into the future a little bit and explain to you what you're about to observe, you know, in your, in your customer base or in your processes or your, 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 your sales or something like that. And so those are, I think, two um, really, really kind of um, ubiquitous sort of applications. And I think the third one that kind of pops out to me is the development of sort of a more longitudinal panel analysis where people are very interested in customer life cycles and they're interested in 
understanding how early, you know, maybe it could be treatments or it could just be indicators or other sort of attributes about a customer's interactions are shaping um, what are their long-term outcomes with the company, whether it's, um, whether it's customer sort of retention or attrition or the development of the, the, their in, uh, willingness to try new products um, or um, you know, any number of outcomes that a company might feel is really important to their long-term success. And again, I think the econometric toolkit is, is so powerful there because we, uh, we spend a lot of time trying to understand the difference between sort of correlative effects versus causal effects and time trends and how you have to control for all these things to make sure you're getting a very clear understanding of what, how, what's actually impacting customers' decisions. And for those reasons, uh, these analyses and these studies end up being pretty influential in how businesses um, shape what it is they're going to prioritize and focus on in their relationship with their particular base of customers. So I think I'll stop there because I think I answered all your questions uh, and I, I don't want to be too wordy uh, right off the bat, but I, so I, I think I'll just stop there. That's great. Thank you so much. That was very insightful. I can't wait to see and read uh, the, the student res uh, responses. Um, our second speaker is Todd Maurer, uh, president at Versatile PhD and founder uh, at Edunomics. And I think maybe if I made a mistake with the pronunciation, he'll cl clarify in a moment. Uh, Todd is a seasoned entrepreneur, a corporate advisor, analyst, and a banker with more than 20 years of experience across the US and global uh, emerging markets. He is president, as I mentioned, of Versatile PhD, a leading career technology platform for many of the world's top research universities and graduate students. Uh, he joins us and we are so delighted. Todd, thank you so much for being with us. Can you talk about the ways in which the PhD toolkit, um, as Neil has sort of been talking through, uh, mm -hmm. but the way the, the PhD toolkit is a natural fit for the private sector and the strategies uh, for engagement? Yes, and thank you, Sophia, for the invitation. Um, I'm going to put up my slides, if that's okay. Uh, have some slides for those of you who do not have any visual. You can always pick these up later, or or certainly take a look. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about unbundling your PhD, and I think Neil gave a perfect example of um, what is happening on the ground. So. Um, before I actually came here, I was looking at, um, I mean, many of you are, uh, you know, have been in a PhD program maybe for a few years, maybe for seven or eight years, and you have a box of being a PhD economist. When you go out in the job market, your particular um, profile is much wider than that. So if I were to go on, recently I went on Indeed and looked at um, economist jobs, there were 1,313 jobs. If I search for economics, goes up to about 5,700. If I look for statistics, there are 28,000 active jobs. If I look for consumer behavior, 21,000. Economic development, 40,000. So the idea is that if you start with a very um, restricted definition of who you are and what you can contribute, uh, there might be fewer opportunities. But as I, I think Neil has shown, and as I'll talk about, um, there's a much wider world out there for, for your skills. So um, let's see if I can. Just trying to get this slide moving. Hold on. Okay, so uh, here's FedEx. Uh, if you unbundle FedEx, it's a nice little chart here. You'll see that from a simple delivery company, in fact, um, it gets into a lot of different areas in terms of uh, price optimization, logistics. Of course, FedEx acquired Kinko's, so it's now in the printing and consumer business. And all this uh, chart should tell you is that when you look at companies in the private sector that you might be interested in, start to unbundle them, start to see what some of their challenges are. And I think Neil went through uh, some of this at Amazon, uh, but these countries are highly intricate. I mean, FedEx is not technically a tech company, but I can assure you that uh, many elements of FedEx make it a tech company um, so that your skills in forecasting or, or price optimization or behavioral theory um, can be um, highly applicable here. So just keep that in mind as you look at other particular companies, try to think about what are some of the challenges that they're facing and try and deconstruct some of what they are. If I were to look at the, uh, let's say the S&P 500 and list all those companies, you'd find a similar situation where you have huge technology components, you have huge 
um, economic problems that they're facing. All of them have uh, an interest and a desire to bring on um, high order economic uh, skills into their companies. So how would you unbundle some of what you have um, as an economist? So I divide it into a couple of areas. So first, you're a problem solver. Um, you know how to do research design. You probably have good statistical analysis, quant methods. Maybe you can program in R. Maybe you can do some other things. You're fairly good at dealing with uncertainty. Um, on the right-hand side, you're good at working in teams, or you probably, through your academic um, uh, career, have done uh, some teaching and mentoring. You've done research collaboration, communication. These are all very important things to emphasize in the private sector. I mean, the private sector, uh, I know that uh, in academia, there's a collaborative culture, but the private sector is even more supercharged in this area in terms of uh, doing your research, but also working across a lot of different divisions, perhaps, um, and selling your ideas um, uh, as they come. Uh, you're also bringing your own academic networks. Um, so just because you've been confined, let's say, at Columbia for six or seven years, you probably have networks that go way beyond Columbia, which could be useful in the workforce. And finally, maybe a differentiator, um, you have some sort of domain knowledge. So you might be a health economist, you might focus on energy, space, climate, you may be a behavioral uh, or experimental economists, you may have done work in different parts of the world. So all of these things can also guide you into what you may be looking for in the private sector. Um, and again, all of these companies in these markets, whether it's education, I've done a lot of work, for example, in education technology, there's an enormous demand for economists in that area, uh, working on education outcomes, looking across um, uh, countries around the world, um, helping publishers and so forth. So I've personally seen a lot of uh, interest in, in that area as well. So again, this is just an example, but you know, start to unbundle uh, your PhD in terms of what it may mean, how it might be applied to the private sector. Um, there's also uh, competition for you. So I could go back to that comparative advantage of a PhD and tell you that a lot of anthropologists, cognitive scientists are also uh, fairly good at statistical methods, research design, and so forth. So just remember that uh, you know, there's a whole range of PhDs that may be applying for particular jobs um, in the private sector. Your differen differentiation as economists is something that you should, um, you should really work on in terms of uh, uh, you know, what would differentiate you from uh, at least the skills level of an anthropologist or a sociologist or, or, or others. So we are seeing some of that. Now, of course, there are some jobs that are strictly looking for economists. Uh, but as I mentioned at the outset, there are a lot of jobs that are looking for PhD economists or those with advanced degrees that bring a certain skill set. So it's important to think about also the, the competition in the market and how you can differentiate yourself. Um, this is a very uh, simplified employer uh, preference uh, chart. Um, really, um, what it says is uh, in the y-axis, you know, the, it's, a, it's essentially soft skills. The x-axis is hard skills. You need to be working with both of those elements when you're looking for work and actually when you're building your career. Um, you know, many employers would be looking for strictly technical specialists. Some may be looking for economists that can bring significant amounts of soft skills, maybe uh, to uh, run an advocacy program uh, for Facebook, uh, working with the government or, or whatever. Um, so again, figure out where you might be uh, in this very simplified two by two matrix, you know, whether you're a minimum viable candidate, um, how you might, however, bring some of your soft skills to bear. Uh, soft skills to bear. We know that uh, uh, Columbia PhD would signify um, a significant level of hard skills. Um, soft skills are also very important in the private sector. So obviously keep that in mind. Um, finally, or maybe uh, the penultimate slide, uh, be a problem solver, not a job seeker. Um, my personal opinion is that, you know, you know most people uh, who are hiring, uh, they know what you're looking for. Uh, they may be looking for uh, a PhD economist, they may be looking for uh, uh, another sort of PhD, they may not specify, uh, but think about that you're being hired to solve problems. Um, so maybe you can try and figure out if you're working with, if you're working towards a particular career or with some particular companies that you're interviewing with, uh, find out what sort of problems um, they are looking at, how you're best positioned to solve them, you know, what sort of academic experience might you bring to bear. Um, I'm generally, uh, uh, 
not a fan of people saying, well, I'm looking for this kind of work or I want a job in, 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 in why, um, you know, you need to get beyond this and really just think about, you know, from an employer's perspective, I mean, what are, why are they hiring you? What are they, what sort of problems do they want to solve and begin to think about all the different skills that you bring um, to that and, and make a persuasive case, um, a narrative that you're really prepared and that you might want to um, communicate to them. Um, there are also, obviously, we're talking about specific jobs in the private sector, but um, certainly there's also a lot of funding available for PhD economists if you are in a particular area where you uh, actually are, have done some research that might be transferred to a commercial startup. Uh, there is a lot of activity among venture capitalists and others that, that I've seen um, and continue to see uh, that actually have funding. So it's one thing to keep in mind if you're more entrepreneurial, maybe you're not looking for a job. Maybe you're looking for uh, some funding that can get your own um, startup going. And um, I was uh, encouraged recently, Michael Kremer, who won the Nobel Prize uh, I think, you know, last year um, uh, for his work in experimental um, economics, um, had a podcast with Tyler Cowen, which I thought was very interesting. And I think he's founded maybe uh, 22 companies in his career. So again, giving some encouragement to economists that maybe want to reach out and, and uh, you know, do something uh, at, a, at a more micro scale um, rather than finding um, work. Um, finally, uh, you know, your career is a test lab. Uh, you should be an, in, your, in your interview process or in your preparation process, you know, test out some of your ideas. Um, you know, don't get hung up on necessarily being an economist in your job title. As I mentioned it before, there are a tremendous amount of leadership positions that do not have economists in the job title. They may be hiring economists, however. Um, so again, think about how you can get things done in a, in a professional environment. Um, look at all the different skills you have along the line. And I would say, um, you know, test them as early as possible. I'm not sure where uh, all of you are on your PhD program, but you know whether you're an early PhD or you know just about to turn in your dissertation, um, start testing out uh, some of your ideas, your skills, your approach in the private uh, in the private sector beforehand, and if possible, uh, you know even become more of a thought leader before um, before you're out there, so people will actually pursue you rather than the need for you to go out and and pursue jobs. Um, so that's uh, maybe I'll I'll stop there. This is just maybe an advertisement on the back. I mean, we work with about 115,000 PhDs across every domain area. Um, and we do have uh, a lot of different uh, courses. We use job analytics. Um, we have career planners and things like that. But the basic message here is there are a lot of tools out there, whether it's with us or anyone else. Um, avail yourself of those uh, particular tools and mentors and so forth and, and really be prepared. So maybe with that, I'll... I'll stop and uh, stop share this and pass it back to you, Sophia. Thank you very much, Todd. That was great. And I think, um, you know, you've tapped into one of the uh, most critical issues um, in the uh, job search process, and that is really to own, <laughs> right, to own it. And uh, what we're doing uh, and, you know, and what you're suggesting is that students need to, uh, to begin owning their narrative, to create a narrative around what they're doing to, so they can start feeling empowered uh, and rather than being uh, 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 seekers, you know, they can sort of create a, a, um, a narrative around what it is they want to do, what problems they'd like to solve in, you know, across their career. So with that, we're going to open this up to questions. You can um, um, unmute yourselves and you could share your video, hopefully, um, and you can start asking questions of Neil or Todd. Uh, you can also type these questions into the chat. Um, do we have any questions at this point? Well, I can begin with a question. Um, can economics improve your management practice and decision making? Can we talk a little bit about what that looks like um, from um, you know, a consultative, how would you consult your clients, Todd, perhaps on that? And maybe similarly, Neil, you can talk a little bit about, um, um, about that in, in, in your spaces, in the spaces you've had. Uh, Neil, do you wanna go first? Uh, certainly, thanks, Todd. Uh, I would can can economic training uh, uh, improve your management ability? I think the answer is a little bit of yes, a little bit of no. I think economists, uh, uh, managers that uh, I have observed, and I include myself since I have managed uh, in, uh, in a post uh, economic PhD version of myself, 
uh, I think they're uh, sort of more in tune to kind of the idea of like marginal benefit versus marginal costs. So they can kind of help shape people's like time management and like prioritizing what they should be working on. And, and, and so I think there's a, there's a more sort of almost like technical foundation of like allocating your time and trying to put your skills to use where you have a comparative advantage, for example. I think these themes sort of pop out in sort of not only the supervisory aspects of management, but more of sort of the team leadership and finding a role that seems to add the most value for individuals based on their skill set. I think all that is as is sort of the good part. I, I guess I would also add that by virtue of having gone through the work, like being stuck at your grad school desk, you know, trying to solve a an awful coding problem that's hanging up that one last result. Like we've been there, done that. So sort of having some of that. Um, shared reality i think can be really helpful and when you're when you're mentoring or supervising uh junior folks who are going through those tribulations maybe for the first time uh, i would say the no part the the negative part is um management is a really rich collection of sort of more technical skills and a lot of soft skills and emotional like the eq like emotional intelligence and trying to like really understand what's going on in people's brains and how they feel and how they respond to certain situations and adapting your approaches based on that. I suppose there's an element of like game theory and sort of like best responses that you could apply to it. But sometimes I think, you know, economists, we were trained so technically, right? Turn everything into a math problem and just solve and then everything's good to go. That doesn't always work with people. You know, people <laughs> have different experiences. They may not always understand the facts or have different information or perspectives or considerations than you do. And there has to be a lot of open kind of free flowing dialogue where it may not always be driving towards some sort of efficient outcome. And that, I mean, that has to be a part of any sort of inner, any conversation or collaboration effort, whether you're managing or working side by side with someone or even reporting up to someone or, you know, trying to have a conversation with a client or a, bit, a senior leader that that you might be, um, you know, that might be part of your leadership or organizational um, chain of command, so to speak. So I think that I would say yes and no. Uh, but on nets, I think it can be a very valuable tool in understanding a management responsibility. Todd. Yeah, I would agree. I think that this combination of um, I, and I've seen terrible. Um, managers uh, with an economics degree, I've seen very good ones. So obviously it's a, it's a mixed bag. I mean, full disclosure. So I left um, Columbia, well, many, many years ago, um, left a PhD track and went to Asia uh, when I was a specialist on China. This was years ago when China was um, kind of opening its markets. And, um, and so I'm not speaking as a PhD economist, um, although I was an economist when I started. And um, what I just, what I found, and I've worked with clients around the world for a couple of decades, um, you know, economics is, is really good at helping to set an agenda and set a framework of discussion um, because some of our economic theories are so powerful and obviously they've uh, sort of developed over the last couple of decades as well. Um, they tend to drive a lot of interesting discussion, um, certainly in the private sector. And part of management is, um, is getting people on board, um, you know, persuading, um, making sure that people are um, integrated into the process. Um, you know, I think that there's, uh, again, a reason to focus on some soft skills or at least soft skills that you may not um, even know you had. Um, you know, while you're at Columbia um, and try and hone them um, because they're going to be very helpful for you um, in the private sector. But, you know, uh, again, um, intellectual exchange, discourse, collaboration, uh, mentoring, persuasion, uh, getting your ideas out there are all part of the management toolkit, um, whether you want to be in on a management side or not, and they can be very effective. Um, so the, the, the floor is open for all students to uh, submit their questions. If you can unmute yourselves and show your video and uh, tell us where you are in the degree um, in the process. If you are on the market this year or if you're a year out or, you know, just where you are, um, you know, you have access to uh, two amazing uh, sort of um, individuals in very um, important spaces. So I would certainly take advantage of this opportunity to engage 
um, in this open conversation. So let's see, should I start calling on people? Um, so I guess another question I have um, in this. I, I have one question if that is okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, hello everyone, I'm a master's student actually in economics. And uh, I have the question if, how are the opportunities in these tech companies, especially for master students in comparison with PhD students? And if you think there is a glass roof or if we have opportunities to grow in those companies? Neil? So I could just say more generally, and then I think Neil can comment on, on Amazon. So, I, I mean, there are certain jobs. I mean, we, we scan, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of jobs, like on a bi-monthly bi basis. And, um, you know, what we find is that there are certain jobs that are PhD required. So there are going to be certain jobs um, in tech companies where they will require a PhD economist. But then there's a whole range of other jobs um, that do not require a PhD economist. And they may have PhD economists on those teams, but they don't necessarily require them. And so, um, you know, it, it really just depends on where, uh, where one is looking. But if, if you are, I mean, there are, for example, a lot of uh, all but dissertation sort of ABD uh, people who have left PhD programs who are also working across the tech sector. Um, there are just generally are a lot of different positions um, that use um, economics um, as an entry point, but not necessarily require a PhD. So I think you'll find, uh, you know, depending on what you're looking for, uh, there may be, uh, you know, more opportunities for non, at, at sort of a non-PhD required level. I would 100% agree with that. I think particularly in tech companies, I, I don't see a lot of like rigidity and hard constraints around you have to have this certification, you have to have this number of years experience. They're always sort of framed as preferred and, and, and uh, that seems to be the trend or pattern, but ultimately not required. And I think that just speaks to um, what Todd said earlier is that everyone's just looking to solve problems. And so if you can position yourself as somebody who can solve problems, uh, you're immediately going to get the attention of those people who have jobs, you know, and are looking to fill them with qualified people who are going to make their team better. And so I don't, I, I don't ever see the kind of hard constraint around a, a degree or some sort of status or, or certification as a, as a hard barrier. I will say that you know at some point you'll you, you might be uh, in a in a role and being asked to solve certain problems and you just and, and you'll, you'll be like oh well I don't think I quite have the foundation on this particular aspect to really go further you know I'm going to have to go consult with somebody or maybe get a, a network you know with somebody who might be able to take it further along and that's totally natural too and that's not that's not um, localized to just the master's PhD. I mean, that's just everything. That's just the general nature of like, what can I do versus what can others do better? And how do I, how do I collectively get to the best answer or the best outcome? And so I think that's where this notion of this sort of vertical stacking of individuals based on sort of one dimension or two dimensions of sort of um, uh, quality or human capital is not all that applicable, at least in the in the jobs I've had, it's a much more multi-dimensional, rich space of people's attributes, intellectual attributes, functional attributes, um, uh, characteristics, and and everyone's just trying to find the right combination across different people and what they can provide to get to the best outcome. And I think that's the nature of how not only opportun not only like projects and 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 um, work situations evolve, but then that, that, that flows back down to the recruiting process and what um, recruiters and hiring managers are looking for in candidates that might be applying. Very good. Thank you both. Do we have any additional questions? One question came in, uh, Lauren, I, don't, I think she may have found it on social media. Um, and that question is how the current economic situation or the remote work situation is affecting hiring trends uh, for econ PhDs or PhDs generally. Neil, 
Yeah. <laughs> I'll say that it's not uh, all that much. Okay. Uh, you know, um, especially, I mean, maybe, maybe my experience is, is just too anchored on the, the tech sector, but uh, in this year of all these crazy shocks to the system, technical, you know, tech companies who largely have a digital interface with their customers um, are doing fine. <laughs> they're, they're, you know, they're, they're continuing to grow. In many cases, they're growing robustly. Like, look at the platform we're on now, Zoom. I thought, you know, their subscriber, like, growth just, like, completely went through the roof because of how much people were in need of their services. So the, the demand, I think, is, is exactly as it was before all these shocks occurred, if not growing generally in the tech areas. In terms of the logistics of it, uh, things of course had to change. We do all our interviews virtually, much like we're doing a conference virtually right now, of, you know, contingent on having a relatively stable internet connection and a laptop that's functioning, that seems to be fine. I do lots of interviews with candidates every week and, and I see, you know, it seems to be that we can have a dialogue and get really good questions and answers just the same virtually. Uh, and starting, but starting work has definitely changed. Uh, there's no more sort of like going to orientation and getting your badge and having lunch with your team. It's all just sort of like log in one day and now you're working. And that's, that's hard. Uh, I think that is going to be really difficult. And I can only say that from afar because I'm not, I'm not being put into that position of adversity. So I don't know, but I think that's going to be a material um, difficulty for anyone who's moving into a new job and particularly anyone who's, who's kind of doing that shift from grad student or just student generally into uh, what might be their first kind of quote unquote, you know, serious sort of work career job opportunity. It's getting acclimated and assimilated with your peers and with your organization and the sort of uh, works patterns and heuristics that seem to define how people get things done. Trying to learn and absorb that all in a digital environment, I think is going to be a lot harder than it would be if you were face to face. But in terms of the opportunities and the logistics, it's been pretty smooth sailing, better than expected. I think when we, when we first realized that we were gonna be physically disconnected from our colleagues and our, our, um, our work you know, sort of uh, relationships for a, an extended period of time. Yeah, I would just add that, um, you know, from a macro perspective, last April, May, June, we saw a huge drop off in job posting. So if you went to any of the glass doors, whatever, the hiring just kind of fell through the floor for a lot of companies. That's completely changed. Um, I think we're, we're back where there is a ton of opportunity out there. There's also um, a lot of startups that just have continued through this whole process. Um, there's a lot of uh, new ventures that are being built um, because of the remote work aspect, uh, because of uh, just the rise of kind of uh, digital and the way we get things done. And so uh, I'm seeing a tremendous amount of opportunity for PhDs, whether economics PhDs or others. Um, and that is really uh, kind of increased over the summer. And I think we're, you know, in these sorts of markets where there's a lot of disruption, you know, there's also a lot of new opportunities. And I think that's a good mindset to have when you go out and, and look for work. Thank you. Any questions? Anyone wants to unmute yourself and show your video and ask a question? Well, we have another question. Oh, Hassan? Yeah, I want to For some reason, I can't start my video, but that's OK. okay. Uh, 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 this is Hassan of Rizzi. Uh, I'm on the faculty side here. It's great to see you, Neil. Great to meet you, Todd. Um, I. So I want to ask about like, I'm going to shift gears a little bit. There seems to be this old perception in academia that private sector only hires people with empirical skills and you only need to know regressions and nothing else. And uh, my own understanding is that that trend has shifted quite a while ago. And a lot of our PhD students wonder about this in terms of what kind of skills they should invest in when they're trying to look for jobs in the private sector. Um, I wanted to ask you about your experience from the other side about what kind of skills do you think these students should invest in? And do you think there's any difference between uh, if I'm a theorist, I have to like stay in academia versus I can find opportunities in the private sector as well? Todd, would you like to take uh, the first crack? Uh, yeah, no, I think... Uh, 
look, I mean, I think if, if you're if you're looking at regression as you know one skill, well, that's that's not very differentiating. I mean, almost every social scientist is using that, whether you're an economist or not. So I think that's. I mean, it's it certainly uh, you know having uh, a statistical background is extremely helpful um, across a whole range of, of of areas. Whether you're looking at consumer behavior at at, at Amazon or, or or other areas, uh, but you know, being a theorist, I mean, ha having the ability to think through problems, um, whatever those might be, um, you know, should not peg you in one way or another as to what your skills are. I would I would argue that. Uh, just expanding um, some of your skills, um, you know, whether you, you might need to work on your soft skills a little bit more, there might be some, uh, you know, programming languages that might, um, that might help in the private sector, getting familiar with um, uh, just some of the tools that are, are being used in the private sector could be helpful as well. But I, I'm a little agnostic on, you know, what specific skill one might need. I think there's just a whole range of tools that, that one can use in the private sector. And it really is job dependent. Yeah, I think what you called out, um, Hassan, oh, and for the record, for everyone watching, uh, Hassan and I were um, uh, grad student office buddies and uh, really close friends when we both got our PhD. I invited him to join uh, just because it was so uh, serendipitous that I could participate here at the same university where he's now a professor. Uh, so that's why uh, he said, good to see you again uh, for all those uh, wondering about that. I think what you said is really spot on where we kind of confuse empirical work and sort of this sort of, you know, practitioner, I can run the regression, I can do the analysis. We kind of, we kind of confuse those to be the same thing. And they're, they're in my opinion, they're not. Like, uh, as Todd said, it's not differentiated. Everyone can run regressions. Um, any individual really could could probably just take a day and you know use Stack Exchange and online free tools to just figure out how to run a regression. That's not hard in in, in any material way. What, what's hard is understanding what the regression is trying to do and avoiding garbage in, garbage out. And I think everybody who's working who who. Anybody who's sort of like trying to manage this sort of economist function in their business, who's done it for a while, will kind of have a, 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 a notion about trying to avoid the garbage in, garbage out. And so I think economists need to have something more than just I do empirical work to be able to solve that problem. They need to be, I think, need to be sharp in their econometric theory. They need to understand like the critical foundational assumptions behind different statistical models and econometric models to understand if it really is the right fit for an empirical problem they're working on and to avoid that garbage in garbage out. I think I spend probably more time doing that nowadays than I do running the regressions. And, and I think that it's an incredible value add because there's lots of people who can run the regressions. There's only a few of me who can actually articulate exactly whether a regression is going to act to achieve the result we're, we're looking for that's going to answer the question that was specified. And I think the second part about theorists is that, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to abstract this. And, you know, since you do theoretical work, you might tell me that I'm all wrong, but a theory is you're, you're, you're positing a view of how the world might work and you're using mathematical tools to derive some results that could be interesting for people to know. And that has a very sharp analog with what business leaders are doing, which is they're trying to posit a theory about how their business and their products and services interact with their customers and what that means for them in terms of how they should optimally respond. So there's a lot of game theory that goes into that. Um, when I think about advertising um, companies, advertising platforms about they're trying to centralize and, and sort of develop some sort of surplus that's taking multiple agents like users and search queries and, and advertisers uh, and, and putting it all together. That's like a mechanism design problem, um, you know, an auction or, or like an auction design kind of problem sometimes. And so these tools about how to posit a view of the world put it into like rigorous axiomatic like foundations and then derive optimal outcomes is incredibly important. Particularly if you're, particularly in a tech environment where you're going to have to define algorithms that are gonna regulate these decisions at high, like massive scale. Like no, no human can sit around and manually inspect like how an ad platform is going to assign ads to users. Like that's just not gonna happen. So the algorithm is going to have to be like 
like rock solid. Like it can't, it can't have any sort of practitioner level vulnerability where it's just going to mess up sometimes because that's not going to be enough. That's not, that's not, that's going to be an unacceptable risk. So one mental model that folks can think about is the work that Al Roth does. Uh, you know, Al Roth is like, wildly influential in actually these applications of, of matching, you know, algorithms that are actually, that are regulating a, a, these, these really like large scale decisions between, you know, whether it's doctor hospitals and, and uh, you know, incoming residents or school systems. And so whenever you're working in a world where these decentralized decision-making processes have to be sort of managed by algorithm and somewhat automated, these theoretical tools are going to become incredibly important to get that, to get that right and figure it out in a way that's going to be um, truly impactful and, and generating the positive outcomes that I think the promise of the theoretical work is intended to, to achieve. Um, so I think, I guess, my, coming back, the long, the long answer, the short answer is no, don't just focus on empirical work, focus on the interplay between theoretical foundations econometric foundations and the empirical manifestation of these two things, because I think that's where the comparative advantage of economic training um, really starts to differentiate in these sort of industrial tech, uh, private uh, organizational environments. Thank you. So another question that came in, um, you know, in terms of sort of piggybacking off uh, uh, Hassan's question, um, talking about the soft skills. I'm wondering also about networking. Where, uh, you know, could you talk a little bit about an appropriate space for, um, for students to start building networks in either the tech industry or sort of, you know, um, you know what are some of the, the, the industry spaces? Um, traditionally, traditional uh, uh, academics focus on AEA, but I realize that, you know, the, you know, they probably need to go a little bit beyond that in, the, in terms of private sector job search. So if you could talk a little bit about um, um, industry spaces to build out networks, um, forge collaborations, um, but also, you know, uh, what is specific to, to, you know, what might be helpful to either, from either your spaces? I think the, the biggest um, learning I took away from kind of pivot, you know, pivoting out of academ academic circles into private, you know, sector circles is that your network gets a wider and shallower versus sort of narrow and deep, if that okay. makes sense. Um, there's no, there's no sort of like straight line path where it's like, well, because my advisor is like, <laughs> because like, I'm really close with my advisor and my advisor like knows the other person's like, you know, department chair, yeah. I'm going to go get job there. Or like my co-author is at this other university and, and, and um, they're going to bring me in for a talk or a visiting position and that's going to convert to a, a, a permanent position with some high probability. Uh, instead, it's a lot of, for me, it was a lot of like, you apply for jobs and you learn about, you, you learn by doing about what they're looking for and what you bring to the table. And that kind of sharpens your kind of your, your elevator pitch or your, your self-awareness of what you're bringing to the table, broadly speaking, and how you can kind of market that. Um, you work with people on, whenever you get a job, you work with people and, and by virtue of you working with them and then they may move to another company, you just sort of maintain that connection. And that can be as simple as just remembering their email sort of in your autofill so that when something comes up, you can just say, hey, it's me, like had a fun question about this or that or the other thing. And then I think it's, um, and then I think it's also, there's some other, I mean, I, I think more discreetly, there's, there's some other trade organizations that I think are informal networks of learning like who's doing what and what kind of positions are open. One of the ones I was exposed to early in my career was uh, NABE, the National Association of Business Economists. It's a different flavor of, of, of an economics community. It's not quite the AEA. You're gonna have people ranging from sort of businessy consultants to data scientists, practitioners to PhD economists working in government or you know, some other places. But it is, it is an orthogonal view of the industry or somewhat orthogonal to the AEAs. Mm -hmm. And I think there's, there's growing forums that are starting to populate, particularly on the West Coast where you have the, the large tech organizations where there's now critical mass economists 
And so I think my, 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 my advice is be very opportunistic. Like no conversation is a bad conversation. Like no, no opportunity to have a name and a, a, a connection in your Rolodex is a bad opportunity. But there's the, the probabilistic nature, like, like figuring out which one of those things is going to be important for you at any given time. Like I've never been able to figure it out. Like it's just, it's just keep, it, keep it as wide as possible so that di- you can be very dynamic and nimble to when there's something that you, could, that you might benefit from having a connection with someone and learning more that you can action on it as, as frequently as possible. Thank you. Todd, is it just as well that students go to Indeed or how would you guide um, job market candidates in terms of job search? Yeah, no, I think on the, uh, the wide and shallow issue that Neil uh, brought up, I, you know, LinkedIn can be a friend for you. Um, there are a lot, there's a lot of private messaging going on um, on LinkedIn. There are industry conferences, uh, there are meetups. There are lots of things going on either virtually or, well, virtually now, but, um, but physically as well. Uh, where you could go and learn and meet lots of people and people are pretty open about, um, you know, hearing ideas. You know, you may have a particular area of research that you could showcase, you know, through a blog or some, you know, some microblogging or whatever else to, to get some attention, to show interest in some particular uh, areas in your field that may impact the private sector. Uh, so some of it is just, as, as Neil said, just, just experimenting, just getting out there, trying things. I mean, we we set up a venture recently at Versal PhD with HeroX. They're related to, um, uh, uh, well, they're a fairly large crowdsourcing platform. And we're basically setting up uh, micro project competitions that work directly with NASA and, and some other, you know, big groups. Um, and so there are lots of different ways to, um, you know, to get in touch with companies, to learn about what they're concerned about, what their problems are. And, you know, there's the typical digital networking, but then there's also just, um, you know, putting yourself out there and, and being proactive and maybe having a more of a directed uh, purpose, some of you. And if you have an interest in a particular area, um, you know, I think you'll find um, a lot of people are open to, uh, to meeting with you, hearing what you have to say. I just like, I'd like okay. to just chime in on that. Yeah. Um, when I was younger in my career, uh, uh, something I saw in some of my colleagues as well, there's this sort of like, aversion like I don't want to put myself out there like maybe they'll think I'm dumb or maybe they'll, they'll think I'm naive or or they're not going to take me seriously although they'll, they'll they'll have some negative view of me and I and I don't want that and that's not true at all like if, if I could I, I want I, I'd really like to underscore that you know to to the folks in this forum that that's not true at all like now that I'm sort of on the other side a little bit not all the way but a little bit like when when when, when individuals reach out to me on LinkedIn or at Amazon or somewhere else and they say, hey, I'm just kind of getting started in my career. I saw your profile looked interesting here. I have some questions. I was wondering if you could chat with me. Most of the time I'm like, yeah, sure. Like, I'm, it, like, like flattery also goes a long way. Like if you just reach out to someone, you're like, you're smart. Like, do you want to talk with me? Like people actually like that. You know, they're like, I'd love to tell you everything that I do and, and kind of talk and, and showcase myself. And so the difference between the people who just, who send those emails and maybe for 10 of those emails, you get four responses and have two meetings. Well, that's two more than the people who sent zero emails. And so I think getting over that aversion and that apprehension um, of just putting yourself out there, being candid, doing some research so that when you're talking to people, it feels like that it's not just some sort of boilerplate reach out, but it's actually you're, you're talking to someone as an individual, but doing that early and often, I mean, you'd just be surprised how even one conversation might just put your name in their head. And then maybe six months down the road, they're like, wait, I remember that name, you know? <laughs> and I mean, Sophia, that literally happened to us this morning. Didn't I it? know, I know. Right? <laughs> but Sophia True. emails me, she said, we had a last minute cancellation, Sandy Black, remembered your name right <laughs> yeah in tech. and Absolutely. it's like that's exactly what happened like I haven't talked to Sandy Black in years but so I think I think that's almost that's a really powerful recent example of how just meeting and connecting and putting yourself out there you never know when it's going to actually convert to something that matters so you, yeah. you might as well just be taking lots of shots and and then uh building that into sort of some upside for yourself as opposed to to hanging out on the sidelines
Very good. Thank you both so much. This was so um, inspiring and I'm hoping the students are feeling inspired and fired up to uh, take action um, and to work hard to be ambassadors for their own career successes. Um, Todd's PowerPoint presentation has been posted online. This conversation will continue uh, on social media and you can certainly reach out to, for those of your students, you can certainly reach out to Lauren Close who uh, takes lead on our, our social media campaign. Um, join us on Wednesday, November the 11th for another discussion on the changing role of economists globally. Our business and finance thought leaders will include Adam Rej, who is the executive director at Capital Fund Management, which for those of you who don't know, it's a global asset management company based in Paris with offices in New York, Tokyo, Sydney, and London. Um, he will be accompanied by Professor David Thesmer, who is at MIT Sloan School of Management. Thank you so much, stay safe, and we will see you soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Appreciate you having me. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, Alberto. Thank you, both.